Welcome to the Teamwork Advantage Podcast with Greg Gregory. Join us as Greg interviews powerful thought leaders and successful team and leadership experts from across the country on teamwork, leadership, and organizational culture. Now let's check in for this week's episode. Welcome back to the Teamwork Advantage, a podcast that is dedicated to the growth, development, and advancement in three very key areas. Teamwork, leadership, and culture are what we refer to here as the TLC of business. Yes, TLC, not what your mother told you, tender, loving care, or if you're a child of the 80s, where it meant the learning channel. We're talking about teamwork, leadership, and culture, where we bring you a guest once a week talking about ideas and strategies to build in those key areas. On the surface, when we look at today's guest, you might think she doesn't really fit our model. I'm fascinated in reading her bio and learning a little bit about her, and I purposely have not taken a deep dive into her background, but I'm really fascinated to do that here with everybody. When we start to talk about teamwork, leadership, and culture, there's always the thing we understand that it involves people. And so today we're going to be talking about people and tech, and as Allison puts it in her uh, bio, bio, It's where the intersection of team of uh, leaders and people and tech intersect. So a little bit about our guest today. She's a writer, an editor, an HR tech enthusiast. That's another word I'm kind of fascinated with. Um, I know of car enthusiasts and boating enthusiasts, but not necessarily a tech uh, HR tech enthusiast. Allison Hunter has worked at the intersection of people and tech for more than a decade. A multidisciplinary lifelong learner, she brings an authoritative editorial vo- voice, firsthand industry knowledge, and a people first perspective to select software reviews where she does serve as their senior tech editor. A couple of other things I did find. She has a degree in anthropology. She also, with a focus in on holistic and empirical methods, I'm anxious to see how they tie into things. The art of weaving a story is just powerful. And that's where we're going to start on today is understanding storytelling and how it starts to play into things with our leadership ability. Ties into human behavior, which is her background. And part of that kind of takes those two and says, Why do we have such a fascination with NASCAR? I know why I like it. I don't know that I would say a fascination, but I think it's the same thing people like hockey games for. Okay, so we're kind of getting into that all the way. Welcome to the Teamwork Advantage, Allison Hunter from Oakland, California. Hi, I'm so happy to be here, but I have to say, if we're going to touch on NASCAR, we're going to need more time. (laughs) <laughs> it is the most popular viewed sport in the nation. That is fascinating, and I'm also not at all surprised. Yeah. So I want to well, talk a little you. bit, because your background, I mean, from anthropology to HR tech enthusiast, uh, I don't exactly see the roadmap on that one. So sure, can you yeah. take us through how you got to where you are a little bit? Absolutely. And so let me further confuse things by mentioning I also have a visual art degree that I got at the same time as I got the anthropology degree. So that just confuses things even further. Um, my, yeah, my path is, has been nonlinear. And I think that this is something that I have in common with a lot of people that I meet in HR, uh, it being such a holistic field, it draws people who have deep interests in a lot of discipline a lot of disciplines. And, you know, often people who are very curious and who follow a path of inquiry uh, to as they move through their life. And I was just happy, I was just lucky enough to be in the San Francisco Bay Area when the first real surge of, of people operations, of thinking of people as whole people, sort of the shift from when HR went from if you ran into an HR person at a party, you would hope that they wouldn't talk to you about their job because it was so boring <laughs> into, you know, big companies, major companies, you know, Google having these paradigm shifting new ways of looking at people and looking at culture uh, and recognizing the efficacy 
you know, the, the, the cold hard facts and efficacy of understanding that we don't stop existing when we leave the workplace. And so I, I was lucky enough to, you know, to sort of come of age mm -hmm. in that space. And since then, I have been very lucky to mostly work in technology um, alongside, you know, these folks who are, I think, sometimes unfairly stereotyped, you know, the engineer stereotype is incommunicative and, uh, you know, sort of culture resistant cowboys or astronauts or rock stars or whatever you want to call them. Uh, and I have recently this this position with select software reviews is I was again just at the right place at the right time for this. Um, I've obviously I have a tremendous interest in humans. That background in anthropology is is there for a reason. I think of that as you know if you're wondering where like the through line through the things that I've done, I really am fascinated uh, in humans as as long as we've existed as humans on planet Earth. And I say that the intersection of of uh, was it people, process, and technology. You quoted mm -hmm. me better than I'm quoting me. Um, is the most the most fascinating space in the world to me. Uh, and another way to say that is, you know, the tools that humans use to do the things that they do are of infinite interest to me. And something that, that I think is very valuable for us to be introspective about. And so, you know, what I what I would like to talk about today. Um, storytelling I do actually think of as it's a tool right I think that it's a thought technology and mm -hmm. most people I don't think we often see it that way it's a great way from a speaker's point of view to illustrate your point from the stage or even if it's a training class to illustrate things I'm anxious to learn more about your storytelling in a direct leadership role or and again keep in mind that a lot of our folks that listen um, also apply a great deal of this to their personal lives to leading their kids uh, dealing with children in general yeah. all kinds of things so this all starts to come into play yeah. so how did you get into the storytelling aspect of things that's a good question i i think that it is well, let's, let's my mind, how did you recognize the importance of it? it? To my mind, it's inseparable from, how do I want to say this? This is what I like about radio. This is what I like about an edit. I, it is inherent to me. It is apparent to me that the way that we deeply connect with people is not through telling them facts, right? Like if you mm -hmm. meet someone, you might say, tell me a little bit about yourself. That person is not asking you for your, you know, name, rank, and horsepower, you know, recite a list of facts about yourself. Uh, it's an invitation to, to connect with that person. Mm -hmm. And it's an invitation to connect, you know, via a story, right? Like when you introduced me, obviously that wasn't, I mean, yeah, it was not a list of facts about me. It's the story of how I got here. Um, and so what is in, intuitive to me is that this is a means by, it, it is a technology, it is a tool, it is a means by which we can get access to features of human consciousness that are not otherwise available. And I think in a business context, uh, it's, shouldn't just be one-sided, right? Like I believe that it's important for me to tell stories as a leader, as a, you know, as an mm -hmm. HR person, it's important for me to be able to convey stories. And here we have a little hole in our vocabulary because while storytelling is a word that we all know, story receiving isn't. I get, maybe we could call it listening, but I think that's a little bit different. Oh, I, but absolutely I think definitely different. In, I mean, it's part of active listening, yeah. but still. It's, it's part of the processing of the story is just way deeper than just listening. It does. I mean, and, and, you know, quite literally deeper. We I'll, I'll touch on anatomy just a little bit, you know, just to, to really keep it coming from all sides of my multidisciplinary background. Um, but yeah, it does. It, you know, these, these are different processes in the brain. They occur in different areas. 
So I think that I, my interest in storytelling is based on my awareness that it's, people are not just a collection of our facts. We're not a repository for data. Um, and like I said earlier, we don't stop existing when we leave the workplace or nowadays, I guess, when we log off, when we turn our cameras off. And it is imperative to recognize those things as if, if you know, for, for successful leadership, it's imperative to recognize a whole person. Uh, and I think that I've been dyed in the wool with, with that sort of uh, mindset, both yeah. in being in anthropology, being in the Bay Area, right place, right time. And that makes so much sense. Then I get to the question, and I've worked with a lot of folks, and whether it's in my speaking business or prior to getting into the speaking training business that I'm in, there's a lot of folks, when you try to bring this part up, they call it foo-foo. Mm -hmm. And some other people may say, I'm here to do a job, but I don't need to talk to you about my personal life. Yeah. Well, you and I know that that's really not what we're trying to do is just dig into your personal life. We're trying to learn about you. Yeah. And what do you say to people who say, none of your business? Yeah. Well, it, you know, it depends on the individual. I mean, I, in my mind, I can think of that type, right? Like I, it reminds me of the mm -hmm. stereotype of all the engineers that I've worked with. And oh, I've had it from engineers. I've had it from all walks of life too, believe it or not. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's not, just, I, it's I mean, not a stereotype of a, a position here. Totally. Absolutely. No. And I, 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 I respect somebody's distrust of me, right? Like I understand why somebody would be suspicious and i think we did part of the american way that we do things right it was very individualistic especially in in business like we yeah. a lot of people are disillusioned with the idea of working together as a team and, and instead like you know every every man woman person for themselves um so yeah what do I, what i do with that when i run into it is you know, I, I believe there's always a way in, but I've also been wrong. And so I guess knowing when to stop mm -hmm. pushing, because yeah. that just makes it worse at some yeah. point. And you can't get in. You can't get in with everybody. No. I, I worked with a person once who he was convinced that traffic was a conspiracy. <laughs> right? Being, I a gave former up. Traffic, being a former <laughs> traffic reporter, I assure you, no. <laughs> I know, I know. And and that's people are people have all kinds of ideas, right? And and I I you just have to know when to stop. I mm -hmm. I, I gave yeah. up on that one. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um is yeah. is learning that and understanding when to use certain aspects of things and remember things. There of course is the old adage, and I think you've heard it so many times as I have, people don't care, you know, what you know or what you tell them or what they hear, they only care about what you feel or how you make them feel. And that's right. They won't remember so what you say. They'll remember how you make getting them into feel. that. So yeah. the question I kind of get into now is how, how is storytelling coming into the context that you, you talk about it in the employee experience? I mean, when they're coming on, how is that impacting them as they're either onboarding or once they're on a team and things like that. Yeah, sure. I mean, I I would say, how is it not affecting them? Um, I, I when I think of an employee of the employee experience, I I am hard pressed to think of a single moment where you don't want access to their entire brain. Um, What about Sorry. what about the person we talked about a moment ago who does not believe in everything, if you will, that I'm there to do a job and only a job, and they are the leader. What do you what do you do and what do you say about that person trying to get into them to get them to recognize the importance of this? 
Oh yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I, increasingly, that's less of an issue. I think that that's sort of an old guard mm -hmm. way of viewing things. And I, lucky for me, I guess, uh, here in the Bay Area, that it's a very rare stance to take. So yeah, that's. I don't know if I have a really okay. I don't have a, a great answer for that. It uh, you know it, the resistance that the person puts up is the shape of the resistance that you put back, and at some point, you know when to mm. not push. Yeah, any harder. They, they but, here, but here's the, the thing, though, too. There, yes. Yeah, absolutely. We, it's not as if these ideas, you know, or the importance of storytelling is something that I just pulled out of the, you know, of my tarot deck or something, right? This is a highly pragmatic, um, if not obvious, but, you know, data driven and effective way to get things done. Right. So I, I, when necessary, and I don't like this very much because I am to my core, a people person and not the kind of person who wants to show you a spreadsheet that I made because it'll embarrass us both. But in the, at the, at the base of this, these are effective ways to get to people and to get them to, I don't want to say behave, but to perform at their best. Right. There's just, there's simply no denying that these are good ideas, that storytelling is a means to connect with people in ways that are are important and profound and in ways that are directly connected to meeting company goals. I can put that on paper. Right. So any right. any like accusation that this is woo woo, this is, you know, this is Bay Area magic talk. It's just not the case. It's it's oh. that is unfactual. Mm hmm. When we look at this, do you have a, a method that you work with to share with people on how to tell a story or how, how to, for the lack of a better word, catalog their stories and understand when they may want to use them and how to work with them on that? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I, I tend to hit, not hit, I, I tend to interact with people, interface with people at a more elementary level than that. Okay. So I would do, I mean, I, I have done, and this maybe relies more on a non HR aspects of my life. For example, mm -hmm. I, for, for some time, I worked in the wedding writing industry, where I was ghostwriting or assisting people who were writing their wedding vows or father of the bride speech. Uh, and in, in that case, you know, all the very personal stuff that, that I had been invited into. Those stories, I would, you know, you sort of listen to somebody, you, you let them empty the contents of their brain, and they probably can see the faint hint of a narrative that runs through it. But if it's not your story, you are able, you know, the outsider is much more able to see the faint hint of a narrative running through it. And then just being aware of your audience, mm -hmm. which you know, the audience, you know, in the case of a wedding, I guess that's our dearly beloved, not so much an audience. And in the mm -hmm. professional situation, those are your, you know, your direct reports, your colleagues. But yeah, I, I respect your audience, I think is one thing. Have a have a clear narrative and respect your audience would be the two things that I would start with. But even before that, I feel like just getting to the point where storytelling is not seen as something that is antagonistic to the way that we generally go about running businesses, professional situations, which I, we were chatting earlier, the idea of solutionism, which is a word that I just learned, but I've needed it for years. Um, and it describes the way that we tend to only engage in problems that are unambiguous, uh, you know, fixable, absolutely fixable uh, and profitable. And, you know, techno solutionism is the one that I, I engage with mostly. So I find that a lot of people stuck in that mindset, like just getting through to them, but like, okay, but there's, here is this oblique approach that you can use to leadership that works. I can show you my spreadsheet, just getting them past that point. Um, is often very difficult because, again, people see it as an antagonistic. They see it as an either or, um, okay. more of a 
a balance, right, than a blend, like that work-life balance, the idea of that. And, yeah, of course it's a blend. Why make it a balance? A balance is a precarious thing. Oh, yeah. And that, I mean, when you say balance is something in that, in that uh, aspect, I'm thinking like a tightrope act. Absolutely. So yeah. that, that's and isn't it comes funny? In. Yeah. Isn't it funny that, you know, for years, it is changing now, but for years and years, a work-life balance was, was a phrase that we all repeated. Mm -hmm. And it just kills me how, you know, just it, in my mind as well, I think of, yeah, I think of something teetering and precarious and that's not what we want. So to kind of just to wrap up that point, getting someone to even view the idea of storytelling as not antagonistic, as not like, you know, right. some, some woo-woo stuff is quite a big step. Um, it, once people are on board with that, they once they kind of click into it, then I think that the intuitive things that we all know about storytelling that we all already do come into play because it, it's not different, right? It's not, you know, here you are as a person outside of work and here you are as a person in work. Like you are, those two are not disunified. Yeah. It is a blended, it is a single human. Yeah. Now, there are some people who in a public life will be different than in a private life, yet there's still threads that cross through those. Of course there are. And that's what people yeah. fail to see. They only see yeah. the boldness over in one side or the boldness in the other side. They don't find the mutual grounds in between that, that yeah. start to come Absolutely. there. So can, can yeah. you give me an example of a time maybe when an employee is early in their uh, stages working with you of something that popped up and obviously we want to keep names and everything out but something that came up and an example of a story that you might have told to really engage that person to get them more engaged in the organization and the team and how they use it that's a great question I can tell you about a time that it went wrong and it wasn't me. Okay. Is that interesting to you? Yeah, absolutely. All I mean, right. the idea so of storytelling was... in general, it, it, as long as we can learn from the ideas of this, that's the power part. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I, my least favorite thing about working in HR, of course, as, and I think this is true for most people who work in HR because we tend to be a compassionate people is having to be or is being present when someone is going to have a really bad day because they're losing their job and they don't expect it so i've been at those tables before and i witnessed one time a a, a person in leadership who in an act of what they believed to be compassion shared with this person who was losing their job that day a story about themselves and for reasons that I won't belabor the realities in which these two people lived were very different, very, very different. And the person, you know, the, the person in leadership who was trying to, you know, comfort or empathize was doing a very, very awkward and tone deaf, uh, just he they were just doing a bad job of understanding how their personal story was different than this other person's story uh and i think that that's you know sort of our tendency to want to do a first person narrative all the time is something that we have to recognize mm -hmm. uh and and as leadership we have to be able to work with that like it takes a lot of effort to get someone to stop putting themselves at the center of the universe all the time Right. Like when you're enticing someone to listen to your story, you're not there's no way you're going to have them sort of like lose sense them, their sense of themselves and go into your story. You know, it's all of a sudden it's your story with them in the sidecar. Right. Or it's them okay. behind the wheel. It's, you know, okay. you have to pull them into it. Right. And in this case, yeah, in, in this in this termination, there was just absolutely no way that the person who was losing their job that day was going to be able to get in line and on board and feel the thing that the the person in leadership was feeling they had a negative effect absolutely fact. absolutely and one of the phrases that i learned oh my gosh i don't know how many years ago and was kind of in a sales mindset was called the feel felt found method 
And that basically goes to, um, in, in a leadership situations, I understand how you feel. And keeping in mind, I may not have felt the same way, so I don't bring me into it. So I understand how you feel. I have known others in your situation who have felt the same way. Yeah. So now I'm putting them into that aspect of that story to see somebody else in a third party. Let me tell you what they found as a result of. Mm. So it's, I understand how you feel. I have known others who have felt that way. And this is what they found. So now I'm not inserting me because I agree. I think yeah. that can be a challenge. Yeah. And of course, the situation must be real. It can't be closet or made up right 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 so, is yeah, that no, something that's, that, that would is... make sense does that make sense in your aspect of what you're talking about oh absolutely yeah i wish that i wish that person in leadership had known that that day mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's absolutely yeah i respecting your audience is absolutely critical and and, and like i said acknowledging that it takes a lot to bring people's perception uh out of this the consistent state of us all thinking that we're at the center of the universe. But it's so good when you do. If you, you can convince a person that they're part of something bigger than themselves. Now, now we're back on Maslow with the hierarchy sure of learning are. and a sense of belonging. They feel like they're part of something that is part of something bigger. Absolutely. And I don't know if in, in the history of humans, if there's ever been a more powerful tool and again, I like the intersection of people and their tools. Uh, if there's ever been anything that's more motivating to people, like, mm -hmm. so, you know, somehow that our individualism will give way into something larger if we feel motivated by that thing. And there are a lot of conditions that have to be present for us to be a part of that, right? Like we have to, the thing that I try to break through the like, well, this doesn't fit on my spreadsheet type of thinking, like that's got to go, got to get that out of the door. Um, and yeah, a handful of other things that, that prevent the, or, you know, a tendency towards solutionism. Um, but once we do that, and once we're in, you know, a mind state where we're receptive to thinking, uh, you know, of course, center of the universe every day of my life, but just softening those boundaries a little bit. Um, it, and I think this is, this is both personal and professional, but a lot can be done. I think mm -hmm. it makes for more effective people. And I, you know, I'm a people person. I'm not an HR person because I care about uh, success, right? right. I, my LinkedIn profile currently and probably for a while will continue to say, I'm not here to win. I'm here to make friends. <laughs> and, and that's true. And I think that, you know, what we do, the most important parts of it are the things that don't have anything to do with work. And I think this is one of those things. And I think that's so true. And I think that's gotten lost in the last several years because of the pandemic mm -hmm. and the fact that people um they they try to separate their lives but i think they've learned through the pandemic and doing the zoom calls with the dog barking in the background or the kids running through the screen images and things like that they're human and i think that's actually brought people together to understand the humanistic approach yeah, about everything absolutely and then of course you yeah. tie in the humanistic uh, approach with the natural behavior styles approach and you start to really see the person. And we need to mm -hmm. see the person as a whole person. And part of that comes from being able to tell a story about yourself, to open up, to build. And you used a word earlier that has not been used on our podcast before. You used the word distrust, mm. as you talked about it a little bit earlier. And we talk a lot, hear a lot about trust. So you can actually build a distrust. I love the way you use that. So when we're building a trust, a lot of times that has to come from being able to share a story to build trust with a team. Does that fall in line with what your findings have been and how you think about it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think about this as a, I, I threatened to use my background in biological sciences and anatomy, but there's, uh, most of your audience, you've probably read seminal work called The Culture Code from, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, fantastic book, but one of the things that that stuck with me was it talks a lot about the a brain structure called the amygdala, and the amygdala is what gets very excited when you're scared. Mm -hmm. It's the fight. It turns or flight. out if you're amyg 
it's the fight or flight, right? And it turns out if that's fired up, that's pretty much all your attention, right? You can't ignore the fight or flight. That's not something that you can power through. So mm -hmm. a lot of our work as, as leaders, as HR professionals should be establishing a very mellow baseline amygdala, right? Like if, if you can't understand the phrase relax and do good work, or if that phrase is counterintuitive to you, you need to, you need to learn about the amygdala. You need to, you know, get your big mm -hmm. frontal lobe, which is a great place doing all kinds of wonderful work for us humans. And just back up and look at are people, do people feel safe? And mm -hmm. if they don't feel safe, you might as well not start doing anything else until they do feel safe. Absolutely. And storytelling is absolutely, I think the best way. It opens up more doors. It opens up more avenues, it opens up more windows to the soul of, of the organization and the people. Um, I did a, uh, a training session several years ago with a neurosurgery group. And I said to them, I asked them right up front, I said, what's the purpose of the amygdala? And I've got 12 neurosurgeons in the room and they're looking at me. I said, I know you probably learned this in first grade, <laughs> but I got them to open up about that. And I got neurosurgeons to see it in a different manner than they normally did really through storytelling. Yeah. Yeah. That's in, in my other fantasy career there, I think that there's a lot of work to be done with storytelling, communication, and the sciences, mm -hmm. because they're uncovering all kinds of stuff that we don't have language for. And that's another, you know, sort of uh, predictive storytelling is something that I think about a lot too, because, you know, we're, we move into spaces that we don't have words to describe all the time. I, constantly our evolution does that and so we need people at the forefront of that expansion that are able to put new and wonderful words around things that uh that didn't exist in the past whole concepts whole ways of thinking mm -hmm. and we see like you know try to explain the internet to i don't know a world war ii veteran and they're they're not going to they're not going to really get it. Like, no, it's, no. You could be the best communicator in the world, but just the, the context is off. And yeah, oh. so we need we need those good storytellers. Well, it goes back and you, what you're just now saying reminds me of something that I learned 15, 18 years ago. And it was talking about with your age range of what you're referring to there with the older generation. The, the expression was that a 10 year old has more computer flying time than an average 50 year old at that time. Mm -hmm. And the 50 year old, the executives were having a hard time grasping, understanding this is when the mouse was first coming out and everything else. So you got to put yourself into the right run of everything here. They could not grasp the concept of double clicking the mouse. Mm. And they're just click it, they would go click, click not yeah yeah and then finally somebody came up with the idea of telling a little story about it and talking about mm -hmm. this little pizza company called little caesars and their tagline I know where this is going uh-huh <laughs> pizza pizza <laughs> i heard it i heard it before you said it it's such a good story i yes. heard it before you even said it no that's yes. absolutely perfect pizza pizza yeah yeah and oh, that's, that's how executives in that particular environment learned how to double click a mouse. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah, it's just, it's so So it's an powerful. example that it, even yeah. in tech world, stories about certain things can come up. Just think about your knowledge of how you learn something and how it can be applied to somebody else. Absolutely, yeah. And those, you know, it's hard, it's really hard to start seeing the world in a way that's different to the way that you see it right now. We, oh, we are, our brains are- We've got are blinders efficient. on all the time. Oh, all the time that we are efficiency engines. And I've heard it described before that like a, a little child's, you know, awareness of things is more like a lantern. And then the older we get, the more it becomes like a flashlight, right? Like we are just, we're focused. There's nothing beyond, you know, this tiny- I'm tiny worried about the time it gets to a laser because that's in trouble then. I don't wanna talk about lasers. That's way too, that's too scary for a Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that, you know, storytelling, we'll use a metaphor here, expands that flashlight. 
It lets mm -hmm. you see things that, you know, it gives you that pizza pizza moment that you need right. so that you, so you can grow. Now there are times that sometimes the vision is so wide that in order to be focused on something, you've got to narrow that focus down. Totally. Absolutely. So yeah. we've got to understand how to open and contract that as best we can. Yeah. I would, yeah. For, for getting more laser focused, I would encourage folks to look up something called a Fresnel lens that's used in lighthouses. It's F-R-E-S-N-E-L. And a lot of lighthouses would use it because it would take a light bulb that projects wide ranging light and narrow a focus down to a single beam. That's powerful for that. But yet there's other times where you need that light to be open and be able to do it. And the storytelling is helping us open that light and get us away from that narrow beam. You just, I'm gonna steal that metaphor because I like it more than the one that I had previously stolen about the <laughs> lantern and the flashlight. So thank you, Greg. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for now, Liz, I've done a lot of work with lighthouses. So, you know, that, that comes back into play with that, so. No, there is a sentence you don't hear very often. I've done a lot of work with lighthouses. I used to be a lion trainer. Right? Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, yeah. Don't, you don't hear that much. When I, you know, say, work, also, when I say work, I'm referring to volunteer work on this particular aspect of it. So, yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. There can only be so many people employed as lighthouse people. And there's, I don't think there's any anymore in the country. Yeah. So, yeah. They're all automated. Um, yeah. It, I want to mention, though, as, as a, an add-on to the idea that, you know, we have these different lenses of perception we can use. We also have a lot of dexterity in our ability to understand symbolic language. Like, we should not limit ourselves in our, in our ideas how, of how we can move people and connect with them to just to just words right like the written written language is very effective it can be very precise but something that i think about an, an example that i like was it wasn't until humans were in space and you know someone had the idea to turn around and snap a picture of the earth it was at that it was at the moment that that photograph was available widely on the planet earth that two very important things happened Number one, the environmental movement sort of went from zero to, oh my God, this is our planet. We <laughs> we have to help this thing. Um, and it could be argued that the internet, like the first rumblings of the internet came out of that as well. Yeah. And all it was, was a picture of a blue ball, right? But that's- blue, It's called the blue ball. Such an, yeah, like what an incredibly powerful small symbol. Yeah. And we see that, you know, we see iconography, I think of like, uh, I don't know. Is the traveler's insurance umbrella still the icon that they use? I think so. Yeah. I, so. I mean, but if it's not, you know what I'm talking about, right? right. Those things are also extraordinarily powerful. Yeah. So we and have so many things. We have so many things to, to work with. Right. And uh, just from a historical point, 50 years ago right now, we had the very first cell phone call ever made. I can you believe that? 50 years? I just read that. Yeah, it wasn't commercially yesterday. readily available for another decade, but the first call yeah. was made 50 years ago. That's absolutely wild. That's, yeah. So in understanding that, so it's uh, what's opened our eyes is technology done that. And then we also have to realize that, and again, that intersection of the human and the people start to come into play. Mm-hmm. Or we, it, we, were never, a, we were never apart from it. No. I, want to, I, I always want to point we that out. We tried to like put we, our dividing walls up. But it's it, not it, how it is. I think we've realized, this, for the most part, we've realized we need to be vulnerable. We need to allow other people in. We need to break those walls down in order to be a successful leader, a successful team player, to build the right culture. We've got to have that dialogue, that open communication, that form of civility that we've talked about on the podcast in the past. Yeah. Those are the yeah. things that starts to open us up. Yeah. This has been a phenomenal philosophical uh, episode. So, Allison, this I is agree. Just closing. Is there anything that you would tell somebody, just one tip for a leader that they might pick up and be able to use on how to tell a story?
don't limit yourself to a traditional narrative and don't underestimate the power of symbology and our ability as humans to to recognize things and the significance of getting into somebody's consciousness with an oblique approach as opposed to a dead-on approach uh, is extraordinarily powerful. Awesome. That is where we're going to end today's conversation. I thought that was just spot on right there. Spot on. Thank you. Allison, if people want to reach out to you, what's the best way to find you? You can find me on LinkedIn, which okay. is my name, A-L-I-S-O-N-P, like pizza, Hunter. Okay. Because as I looked up Allison Hunter, there's, of course, a lot of them. So it's Allison P. Hunter is yours. P, the P is critical. Yeah, I am, I am some of the Allison P. Hunters that you can find online. There's, okay. there's a few of us, but yeah, okay. I, I do have Allison P. Hunter at LinkedIn. All right. And in our show notes, I'll make sure I uh, put the direct link into your site there so people can get that from our show notes. Fantastic. So. Wonderful. It was a privilege having you on board here with the Teamwork Advantage. You know, folks, once a week with the Teamwork Advantage, you get ideas that you could implement. And Allison's given us several here today. Put it into play right away. Think of it almost like a Venn diagram is what she was talking about. People, processes, and technology. All of that starts to come together when we put that together for everybody. Once a week, you get ideas you can use right away. And remember, as I say in the podcast, never have a good day. Because a good day is just being average. Make sure you make every day an excellent and exceptional day. Until next time, take care. Bye-bye. You've been listening to The Teamwork Advantage with Greg Gregory. Be sure to like, subscribe, and activate the bell icon to be notified of future episodes. To learn more about how Greg can help your organization develop a powerful winning culture, visit TeamsRock.com. That's TeamsRock.com.